Uh, Kim has been an aerial surveillance officer with Transport Canada's National Aerial Surveillance Program for 11 years and is the National Training Standards Officer. Uh, she develops and provides operational training and develops standard operational procedures for the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance division of the NASP. Her work also involves supporting R&D projects and facilitating partnerships with researchers using NASP data. All right. So thank you, Judge, for the introduction, even though I wasn't able to hear it, but I'm pretty sure he told you that I'm the National Training and Standards Officer for the NASP. What that really means is that I train all the surveillance officers, I develop the procedures for the ISR division, and I get to plan special projects for the NASP. This is my first time at the uh, Oscar conference, and I'll be providing an update that was last uh, provided at the technology workshop in 1990, uh, sorry, in 2019 from my boss, Julie Armstrong, who is the superintendent of NASP ISR. For those of you who are not familiar with the NASP, I'll we'll be providing a brief background and then followed by what are we up to now in our current status and activities, and then finish up with what's coming up for the program. So the NASP is the Canadian government's national aerial surveillance program. Its primary mandate is to support the enforcement of maritime pollution regulations. But as a government resource, we're a multi-task platform. So on every flight, we're supporting maritime domain awareness during environmental emergencies, like large floods or recovery operations, uh, sorry, large spills, the recovery operations, floods, wildfires, train derailments. NASP provides situational awareness, and now more prominently, we're supporting the efforts for the protection of the of endangered species, particularly the Northern Atlantic right whale and the Southern Resident Killer Whale. There are other Canadian government aircraft, military, fishery, search and rescue. All of these aircraft have different equipment, different training, and they fulfill different mandates. So the primary mandate for the NASP is maritime pollution. A quick history of the program. So pollution surveillance started in Canada in 1968 in the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. The NASP was officially created in the Canadian Coast Guard in 1991. So 2021 is our 30th anniversary. In 2003, the NASP was transferred from Coast Guard to Transport Canada. Up until 2006, all of our patrols were done visually. The pilots with cameras flying at low level visual conditions. Between 2006 and 2008, the program acquired a maritime surveillance system for each of its aircraft, the MSS 6000. So up until 2018, the NASP was actually operated by three different departments, Transport Canada Marine, Environment Canada, Environment Canada um, and the uh, Transport Canada Aircraft Services. But in 2018, we were all moved into Transport Canada Aircraft Services. So on this 30th anniversary year, there's lots of growth, lots of development underway in the NASP. We've acquired a fourth airplane. We have uh, our path operations going on, new hangar and special projects, which we'll talk about shortly. So let's start with the challenge of conducting maritime surveillance in a country with the longest coastline in the world, 202,000 kilometers. For comparison here, you can see Europe covers only a portion of the northern part of Canada, let alone the southern part of the country. So how do we cover such a vast area? We currently have three dedicated aircraft with three teams covering the three coasts two twin-engine Dash 8 and one four-engine Dash 7 for Arctic operations, all equipped with the same surveillance system. There are approximately 70 personnel, including pilots, aircraft maintenance engineers, surveillance officers, and then program management. We also have access to private contractors that fly some pollution hours for us, and this is PAL. And these teams are located in three areas across Three main bases in the country, one in Moncton, New Brunswick, covering the Atlantic, Great Lakes, and Newfoundland and Labrador, one in Vancouver, BC, covering all of the Pacific and the Western Arctic, and the Dash 7, based in Ottawa, that relocates to Iqaluit during the summer months to cover the whole Arctic. Oh. 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 Uh, we just skipped a bunch of slides, but uh, we'll... <laughs> Continue on in here. Uh, so the surveillance effort for 2019 uh, was uh, covering, as you see, the Pacific Coast and then up into the Western Arctic. And then, so these are the three aircraft tracks. This is a fairly typical year for us, nearly 4,000 flight hours. But in 2020, here we are. Um, we conducted all of our operations south of 60 degrees uh, to help protect the isolated northern communities. Uh, we continue to conduct flight operations during COVID only slightly less hours than a normal year. So we're looking at uh, 
approximately 3,500 hours uh, for this year. So how are these hours spent? We'll take a quick look at the surveillance equipment that we use. So each of the NASA aircraft has the same surveillance system, as I mentioned. A side looking airborne radar, which is used for primary uh, anomaly detection on the ocean, sur ocean surface. We have an EOIR, uh, the electro-optic infrared camera, an MX-15. Digital still cameras and video camera. IRUV line scanner used for mapping and uh, oil analysis. AIS system, as well as satellite and radio communication systems. These are all integrated into a single or on one of our aircraft, a dual console configuration with a moving map. All of the data is georeferenced and recorded. Uh, we'll take a look at each of the different sensors and how they support our operation. So the side looking airborne radar, radar is an active sensor. Uh, it works for the same principle as SAR uh, on the satellite, where we're looking for the dampening that oil causes to the sea surface. This has allowed us to dramatically increase the program effectiveness. It can be used in low, um, in dark conditions as well as through cloud. Um, this sensor requires wind on the surface, so that, that threshold of wind between 5 and 25 knots. And this sensor has about a resolution of about 60 meters. So this radar um, is effective up to 45 nautical miles per side of the aircraft for solid vessel detection. But for pollution detection, detection is only useful uh, when we're when it's in the sea clutter range, when we have a uh, backscatter. Here you can see a vessel and a polygon behind it, this green line that outlines the area of the oil. And here we are uh, off the Gulf of Mississippi during Deepwater Horizon. The EOIR camera, this is an MX-15. It can, it's a recorded video that we can also live stream. It's used for target identification and analysis video and we can take still images from it. We can live stream to a command center and we also have a laser illuminator to allow us to gather evidence during dark hours. Some images from it so we can identify. Uh, this is an optical camera which we can use to assess the scene and provide situational awareness. And in the case on the upper right hand side we can see a vessel underway with oil directly in its wake which we can live stream if needed but also for gathering evidence. Digital still camera, uh, so we have uh, one on board, and for every single image that's taken, it's automatically annotated with uh, the GPS information about the aircraft. This provides uh, documentation, allows us to identify targets. Our surveillance officers are trained and honing their skills to capture images. Capturing an image of oil on water is not an easy thing, especially from a moving aircraft. <clears throat> it's primarily used for doc documenting pollution incidents. So visual identification of the source of the vessel, as well as clean water ahead and behind it, and then documenting the visual characteristics of the oil itself. In this case, it's an incident of a vessel underway with oil in its wake cab for 22 nautical miles. The next piece of equipment we use is the IRUV line scanner. Uh, it allows us to identify the thicker parts of the oil, as well as to document the entire spatial extent of it. As it did here in this large spill, where the, the orange polygon is the, is the total spill size, and then the pink is the actionable oil. We also have the automatic identification system as well as satellite communication. We can share this information in real time. Part of the NAS program um, that we work in close partnership with is the iStock program. So, this is from Environment and Climate Change Canada, where the Canadian Ice Service does the analysis of these of uh, satellite imagery from radar sat sensible. And then when they detect an anomaly on the sea surface, they can tap the NASA aircraft and ground truth and confirm the anomaly of our hydrocarbon. And this can usually be conducted the same day with the results transmitted back in flight. <clears throat> the current stats, historically, one of the challenges for the NASA has been data management and making use of it uh, for the surveillance officers and management. We have data back, down, back to 2006 that was all stored on hard drives and Excel spreadsheets. Uh, but recently, Transport Canada has signed a contract with Esri and allows us to use, do deploy uh, EGIS. For that, I was able to create those surveillance effort maps that we saw uh, in the last slide, but also these pollution maps. So they are they're automatically, um, the data is imported automatically at the end of each flight. Uh, here we can see spills observed to this current, uh, this time, so I captured this on February 10th, so we've seen almost 500 spills to date uh, this year for the NASA alone. And you 
you can see the larger uh, spills are yellow and orange. As you zoom in, you get to see uh, local area. You can identify the pollution hotspots around ports, but also spills observed in the offshore and in the shipping route. And as we continue to dill, dra dill, drill down, uh, the polygons actually start to fill in the, uh, the gray lines, which show the actual polygon size and the, the area of it. And then we can continue to drill down into the metadata, so the, the volume of it and the codes that were given. So these maps would have taken us in the past, we would have waited till the end of the fiscal year and then done all the maps. In addition, EGIS allows us to create dashboards like this one here, where we can monitor the annual map casting, providing not only the spatial representation of where they are, but also the graphs and pie charts, the total number of counts, and allow surveillance officers and managers to have a common and current picture of operation. These dashboards are also used for some high profile missions, uh, particularly um, for the Northern Atlantic right well mission. So although the NASA's primary mandate is monitoring for maritime pollution, as they said, it's a multi-task aircraft. So Transport Canada is deeply committed to the protection and recovery of endangered species, and Northern Atlantic right whale is one of them. There's only 366 uh, whales left, and they travel into the Gulf of St. Lawrence to forage between April and October each year. Uh, one, of their, one of the risks for them is interaction with commercial vessels as well as fishing. So what the NAS does is conduct regular surveys during the season to ensure or to know where the whales are. And if they are in close proximity to the shipping lanes, there will be an imposed speed limit on all vessels greater than 30 meters of 10 knots. And that uh, speed is imposed for 15 days. So the NAS has to conduct, conduct these uh, overflights regularly three or four times a week during those, uh, during those times. So we have to keep track of all that information and needs to be readily available in these dashboards. So this is a live version, or when this is a live version of the dashboard, we get to see the current number of flights, as well as flight tracks, the whales sighted. And then, so the pressure is really on for NASA to conduct these missions and keep track of them in a, in a significant, uh, because it's regularly briefings on them. We'll jump over to the NAP, to NAP's role in uh, response and incidents. So when we're when there is an incident, we're going to be map, mapping and quantifying the spill, relaying the size and extent of command, really providing aerial support to the crews, and then situational awareness. Uh, luckily for us, we haven't had any really large spills in the last couple of years since 2019. But two of the ongoing ones were from sunken vessels uh, that the Coast Guard needed to uh, do an extraction from the this one in particular from the Noah's L operations. This is a bulk carrier that sank in 1985 in Newfoundland, and it started releasing oil almost immediately from when it sank. During the recovery operation, many many types of uh, technologies were deployed to monitor the situation, and the NAS uh, was part of that. The Moncton-8 conducted daily overflights to monitor and report on the observations during the extraction period, a six-week period, and then we relay that information to the command post. We also had someone deploy to the command post to receive the information, disseminate it, and also interpret it, um, and then plan for the next day's operations. So the NAS is not was not dedicated to this incident, but they had to continue to do their routine operations, including the Northern Atlantic right whale well ops during that time. So jumping back and forth between uh, New Brunswick and Newfoundland. Another incident that's ongoing right now off the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island, a uh, sunken vessel, the Shinik, that uh, sank in 68. It's now started upwelling, and they're estimating about one to four liters per per hour. Uh, these this oil started to be observed in September, and now the NASA is conducting regular uh, overflights to monitor it, as well as there's a full deployment on the scene right now. So we're conducting three to four overflights per week, uh, doing the mapping and quantification. This is done in just part of our routine flights. So we conduct these five to six hour flights. We just plan, uh, fly over the area, spend about ten minutes on scene and then provide the information to the command center. So that's our current status. We'll shift into what's coming up next in this 30th anniversary year for the NAS. We've got a lot going on, as I said, fourth aircraft, a remotely piloted aircraft system is being acquired, uh, Arctic hangar, and then some R&D projects. So this fourth aircraft, uh, this is it here, it's TFM. Uh, the aircraft was delivered in January 2020 in the correct uh, paint scheme, but now there's lots of work to be done on it, adding ox tanks, flower antenna, an entire surveillance system, uh, which is currently out for bid. Uh, so that should be closing in a few weeks and we'll find
find out uh, which company has won that bid. But there is the requirement for it to also have a FLAR or a UV EOIR, the moving map system, to complement what we already have in the other aircraft. Uh, TFM is going to be primarily used for North Atlantic right well missions uh, during the season, but then it's going to be used as a swing aircraft to allow the others the time offline to get the essential maintenance and upgrades that are needed. Uh, estimated in service date, uh, 2022. Then we have our RPAS program, so the remotely piloted aircraft system. Uh, aircraft services is conducting our, our path missions uh, to develop beyond line of sight regulations for Canada. So working closely with Transport Canada regulators, NAV Canada, and air operators to safely integrate our path operations into busy uh, airport operations. They're building the procedures right now so that we can, so that we can do that. Over the last three years, the RPAS operation has been conducted um, using the Cybel camcopter off of a Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, and then also the Sea Hunter over a few years, uh, doing various mapping, uh, sorry, different mission types, mapping infrastructure, Arctic highways from Yukon border to Tuck Yuck Duck, uh, conducting beluga whale surveys, as well as in support of the Northern Atlantic right whale. So just uh, recently, Elbit, Systems Limited was a successful bidder and will be uh, providing a Hermes 900 Starline RFAP along with the ground, ground control system, ground support equipment, bears, and then also training. So the RPAS will support NASA operations up into the Arctic up to 70 degrees north and will have an EOIR sensor, AIS, mapping camera systems, uh, maritime radar, as well as the satellite communication systems for command control and then data transmission. Data transmission. So ASD, ASD is currently building the capacity to operate uh, both the piloting and operating these sensors. Another area of development for the NASP is establishing supporting infrastructure in the Arctic. So NASP aircraft um, support Canadian uh, effort in safety, security, environmental and economic interests in the Arctic. And the Dash 7 deployed to a Calivit Nunavut uh, to do that. To date, since the operation started in the Arctic, the crews have been working with no hangar and then staying in rented rooms and hotels, which can offer some challenges to the operation. The so Transport Canada is investing in the infrastructure in the Arctic, and so there's going to be both a hangar uh, for the Dash 7 with capacity to support the RPAP, and then also the Coast Guard uh, helicopters and then to build an accommodations unit for the crew. There's been some delays due to COVID, but we're hoping that the hangar will be op operational by summer of uh, 2023. A couple of the special projects that are underway. So the Canadian government has uh, some programs to support Canadian innovation and technology, and the NAP is uh, coupling and working with two of these, uh, Range and Bearing Corp Corporation, as well as TerraSense. And both of these are using edge computing or onboard processing and data fusion to support ISR operations. The first one is Spothawk from Range and Bearing. So this is a turnkey system ready to deploy an aircraft to provide. Uh, to provide remote sensor integration. So it has its own sensors that can be installed, but also integrates with the ones that are already there for the map. So it takes in the FLAR, RUV, MX-15, AIF, and the SATCOM. And then it also has now included um, an IMU, so an inertial measurement unit, an INS GPS, and then some soon-to-be-installed new sense imaging sensors. Uh, the INS and IMU provide the needed input so we can do all-access inertial positioning, which allows real-time orthorexication of the imagery, allows for train compensation, increasing the accuracy of mass data. Uh, we're working in a, develop, a development operational environment with range and bearing, so the surveillance officers can go out and test some functionality. Uh, the feedback is provided, and that night they do the upgrades for us, and the next day uh, we're ready to deploy the new, uh, the new software. Uh, this is a surveillance officer system, not a mission system. We already have a mission system, the MSS 6000, that does the job really well, has for 15 years. So what Spothawk does is improve and advance the remote sensing side of it, um, it's enhancing the mission system, allowing us to really focus on the talent of the surveillance officers. But it can actually act as a mission system substitute if needed. So in the current NASA mission system, the information is all provided to the surveillance officer, but they have to cognitively, sorry, I keep jumping ahead. Keep jumping ahead on me. Ah. There we 
we go. So what this, what the new system provides for us is a real time oil spill polygon creation from the motion imagery. And then it also provides this augmented reality of the sensor. So I can look at the EOIR, I can see the EIF targets, I can see the persistent polygons uh, when they're created. I can also see sensitive areas that are brought in by shape files. So all of that is integrated in, in my visual so I can see it. Um, it also, so it, it's enhancing the surveillance officer's operational, uh, operational picture. How it's doing this is edge computing, so allowing real-time ortho mosaicing. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, it keeps jumping ahead on me and I'm not touching anything. All right. You should try and, uh, and uh, speed this up here, Tim. Processing, the graphics processing unit is a very mature um, system that uses sophisticated multi-look radiometric control for near seamless broad area mosaic. And on the left, you can see an ortho mosaic from the Bly Island spill and the polygon generated from oblique uh, EOIR imagery. And then on the right is an ortho mosaic from several hundred frames captured from a long wave thermal infrared sensor on the Spot Hawk uh, payload system. And it's autonomously uh, pointing, um, having a, an autonomous uh, pointing profile and then creating that mosaic. <clears throat> Uh, Kim, if you can try and wrap it up, you're you are running out of time. Okay, uh, the la the last one here. This is the uh, Arctic Mist. Um, it's going to be it's a thirty month project that just started in July. Uh, so we're going to be and this is going to be looking at uh, creating um, edge computing on board uh, to fuse the data and then applying artificial intelligence for real time data analysis. So they're going to be fusing all the data, creating the database for artificial intelligence. Um, we're just at the front stage of this one, finishing up really quickly. Uh, Transport Canada, my program has uh, zero tolerance for pollution and illegal discharge. We're putting, there's lots of investment going into new technologies to support the NASP and its mandates. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions and there's contact for the two other um, for the two other special projects if you have any questions for them. Okay, well, thank you, Kim, for that uh, excellent presentation. And uh, if Tom Cullen is out there, uh, Tom, we need a dash eight here in California. Ha, I hear you, Judd. I was uh, <laughs> salivating, thinking back 30 years when I flew the air I missions with a lot of those same technologies. And it's uh, great to see that it's alive and well and doing great things, especially the remote aircraft part. Yeah. And uh, as I've told uh, Louis Armstrong in the past, should we have a large uh, marine casualty uh, offshore California here, you can be sure you will receive a call from us to come on down and uh, and do your do your thing. Okay. And, Happy to come down uh, anytime. Uh, well, we'd love to have you, believe me.